Hi, I'm Kevin O'Loughlin, Chief Executive and Founder of Nostra. Tech evangelist Kevin O'Loughlin founded Nostra Systems in 2006, along with his brother Barry, Gary Byrne, and Senan Fanukin. Having endured the hardship of the global economic downturn, which threatened to shut down the fledgling business, Kevin and his team have since grown Nostra to become a global player in the IT sector with revenues in the tens of millions. I grew up around entrepreneurship uh, in the middle of Leash in the 1980s. I uh, grew up in a, in a in a house that was uh, a farm, uh, a pub, a shop, um, and uh, my dad, on top of that, had a full-time job running a meat factory. And being around somebody who would work for, you know, seven, eight, nine hours a day, in fact, driving from Leash to Dublin every day and back home, and then working in a pub uh, after he got home for the night, uh, and then working all day Saturday and all day Sunday, and then on top of that, going out and mending fences and putting cattle in trailers. And what I got to see was people who had a relentless focus on, uh, on achieving something. And, and for me, I think my dad had this uh, objective to give something better uh, to his kids than, than, say, he had grown up in himself. And that's not reflective of how he grew up, but the times had changed and he just wanted the best for us all. And he worked relentlessly hard to achieve that. Um, and what I really learned was, if you want something and you really focus on it and you work hard, you can achieve it. Um, and I probably didn't learn that lesson for 30 years afterwards, but, but you know, watching what he did, watching how he did it, his focus on it, um, was quite an amazing thing to do. As a, a family of, of five kids, and, and all of us have a very similar focus on on what we wanted. We were all extremely ambitious and being able to, I suppose, learn from our parents who were extremely different. Um, my dad was a, a really hard worker, um, a really uh, big thinker. Uh, my mum was, you know, an exceptional uh, people person. She was uh, phenomenal with, with, you know, managing a family and, and running a, a pub and a shop uh, and a post office at the time. Um, and you know, to be able to balance everything was, was quite an exceptional thing, particularly at a time before technology. Nostra is uh, a business founded in 2007, and we will be seen today as one of the uh, best managed service companies in Ireland, which ultimately means we manage the IT for about 300 Irish organisations. Uh, and, and most of those organisations, or a lot of them, would have offices around the world. Um, 30,000 uh, PCs are managed and users are managed by us on a daily basis and we see that number continuing to grow despite the current uh, downturn in the tech sector um, we see that as a big opportunity for us to scale faster and we're really going to push. Um, our expectation is we'll grow to 50 million euros in 2023 and continue to scale where we've 100 million euro in our sites in the next three years and to get to about 600 employees. Um, we're really trucking at this point and it's, and it's, you know, it's been a, a long, long journey, but we've an amazing group of people who, uh, who understand and like the philosophy of Nostra, which is quite different. Um, and we've uh, a real family culture where, where, we're, where effectively we want to make sure that every person in the, in the business has a plan. They know what they're trying to achieve themselves they know what the business is trying to achieve and everyone works together in, in, uh, in, in as much harmony as they possibly can to deliver for our customers. Our policy is always do the right thing and if you always do the right thing you'll keep your customers for the long term and we would have probably one of the highest client retentions of any MSP in Europe um, and that comes from at every point every team member from an engineer to a, an account manager has to make sure that they are delivering for the customer what the customer requires, not necessarily what they ask for, because it's our job to understand what they need and to make sure we're delivering that. And 
we make sure that we deliver only solutions that they would sell to a family member rather than a solution that is, is something that they will buy because often what they were willing to spend might be three times what they actually need and we want a customer for 20 years and not three years. So our objective in the next four or five years is to really scale out and grow and then probably in three or four years we'll, we'll stand back and take another uh, look and view of what the next phase is and our objective is to grow to being one of Ireland's largest companies. And one of the things that I learned from uh, my parents was, you know, if you want something, you do have to work for it. Um, and we were never really handed anything. Um, anything we wanted, we had to work for, we had to do jobs for. Uh, and it gives a great insight in, into what we wanted ourselves. And I remember, as an example, in, in 1995, uh, mobile phones kind of became much more commonplace. And, you know, I wanted a mobile phone and there was no way that it was going to buy me one. So I was like, well, how can I, how can I do this? And, and I had, you know, built computers uh, for myself um, and bought components and put them together. And I said, okay, well, maybe I could actually start doing this. So I used to, you know, get the newspapers, the Dell ad on the front of it, and actually sell the Dell computers to people. But I'd build a, a, a standard computer in the back end and, and make some money. Um, and I bought my first phone when I was 16. And I remember it was such a proud moment for me to be able to do that. I remember going to college in 1998 and, and sitting in, in the back of a lecture hall and uh, talking about what was, you know, coming at the end of college. And I was looking going four years of college and uh, we were talking about the salaries uh, that were, were expected at the end of it. And I was sitting there uh, listening intently and the lecturer said, you'd start out of college with probably a salary of 25,000 pounds at the time. And I remember sitting there going, I'm making more than that at the moment, selling two or three computers a month. There is no way I'm going to do four years of college to earn less than I'm currently doing. And it didn't make any sense to me. So I, I actually left college. I went and got a job and I ended up staying in that company for seven years, working in, in lots of different roles. Um, but for me, it became quite unfulfilling because I suppose I always grew up around somebody who could leave work whenever he wanted to, you know, while he might have worked more than anyone else, it was his choice. And, uh, and I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I always wanted to work for myself. I always wanted to have that choice and to create something. So I uh, decided I'd take some time off and I went traveling the world, traveling for a year, headed to uh, Warsaw. On night one, met a guy at the, at the Marriott Hotel in Warsaw, the top floor an American uh, guy and he was telling me about virtualization and the technology that uh, had come out and I was well aware of it and I really loved the concept of it and one of the things he said to me is you know I was telling him I was going to travel for a year and he said in a year's time you'll have missed the boat if you're going to do it you got to do it now and I remember thinking no one in Ireland is really doing this so I turned around after a week went home and the concept for for Nostra was born. When I look back and I look at the reasons I started it, um, you know, I had at that point an ambition to work for myself, which was important. But actually, I had become quite materialistic and, and I saw owning a company as being a status thing. And it was important to me uh, at that time in my life. And I, I would say that's definitely not the right reason to start a company. The other thing, I, I definitely wanted to make money. And my objective from day one was to make as much money as I could. And over the first 12 months, we did exceptionally well. Um, 2007 in Ireland was booming. People had money, you could borrow money. We were selling solutions and actually making an awful lot of money in a very short space of time. And I remember Q1 of 2008, we just couldn't keep the order book uh, under control. We were getting phone calls from people and it was phenomenal. And I very specifically remember uh, a Friday morning, the 28th of March in 2008, getting a phone call from the office and they said, we've got a letter from the bank to say that there is uh, no more uh, IT leasing going to happen in Ireland. It wasn't an Austria specific issue and uh, IT leasing disappeared. And I knew what that meant for our business because every solution we sold was backed by leasing. 
And we went from doing 300,000 euros a month with probably 60,000 a month in profit in our second year to 50,000 euros a month and 40,000 euros a month of a loss. And we did that in one month. And the change was absolutely rapid. Customers weren't saying they were going somewhere else. They were just not buying. People weren't prepared to write big checks for technology. And then you're looking at all the different banks failing. We waited for nine full months before we took any action because our belief was we weren't in recession, which was the wrong belief. And our belief was that the customers who we were talking to would still ultimately order. And that didn't happen. And by the time that that 2008 was over, we were half a million euro in, in, in red. We were in real difficulty to pay our wages, to just stay alive and survive. And we were still losing money on a weekly basis. And it was a very, very difficult scenario. And I had ultimately buried my head for seven or eight months in the, in the sand. And, and roll on the, the start of 2009, the first thing I realized was something had to change. I couldn't possibly cope with it. And I started training in the gym every morning, stopped drinking. And every day I went in and I decided I would face all of my suppliers, all of my customers and all my team with absolute transparency and honesty. And I met every supplier. I told them we couldn't pay their bills, but I asked them to keep us open. I explained that there was no value in shutting us down because we would nothing to give, but my commitment was we wouldn't make the challenge any worse. And I went to all the staff and I asked them to take pay cuts, which they all did, and really supported me through that scenario. And one of the things that really shocked me was, you know, I went to team members and said, I'm cutting your salaries by 20%. And they were going, thank you for not firing me because that was the expectation that everyone was going to be made redundant and they'd have no jobs. And the team wrapped around me and they were unbelievable. My customers all paid their bills early, which was unbelievable. And our suppliers all backed us. And over the next two or three years, we cleared all of the historical debt and got back on a, on a, on a, on a, a level playing field. But that journey was just so immensely difficult. You're waking up every morning, you're going into your office, you're knowing that you have to make a sale to just pay your bills on that day. And there was lots of times when I had to ring people and say, we can't meet the commitments that we've made. We're going to have to delay a payment by a month or two months. And they were weekly and monthly phone calls for an almost five year period. And that, I think for me, the big learning in that space was around resilience, that you have to get up, you have to share your challenges with your team. You have to actually be open and honest and tell everyone exactly the truth. Don't try and hide behind something and don't promise something to a supplier or a customer or a staff member that you know you can't deliver upon. Because ultimately, if you lose credibility, you've lost everything. Those couple of years um, had a huge toll on me personally. And, you know, even my ability to have a relationship outside of the office was non-existent. You know, you, you wake up every day, you're purely working to stay alive. For that five year period, I was broke all of the time. And the learning really for me is, what, what is life about? And life for me is about it's the people that are around you. It's your ability to actually cover your basic costs on a daily basis. And then for me, it's about fulfillment. So it's about actually going, I'm going to try and achieve something with my life and actually going on that journey to get, to get it. And if you don't ever achieve it and you spend your whole life on the journey, in my view, that's far better than never setting a big objective and never going for it. At the end of the day, if my child was sick or if uh, my wife had a, had a challenge, I would sell every asset I had to, to try and make life better. All that's important to us is the people that are, that are around us. And if we work really, really hard and we're very successful or we catch a lucky break in life, well then maybe we're able to afford the things that we want. But actually, none of them deliver happiness because you know, you can, you can have the nicest car in the world, but if you're sitting there in it on your own, it's no fun. Um, you can have the worst car in the world and if you're sitting there beside the love of your life, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, and that's what I think a lot of people miss. Um, and entrepreneurship is not about um, building wealth. In reality, it's about building something that you're proud of. And if you do a really good job, you might get wealth or you might not. We had a party in the office recently and had five or six people come up to me over the course of the night thanking me for, for giving them a start. 
and one of the people in particular had said to me he'd been four or five years trying to get into the IT industry. He was he was a, a delivery driver prior to joining us, and now he's in. He's he's on the ladder. He's really excited. That to me gives me more joy than anything else in the world, uh, and that I think is is so so important. How do you get through a crisis? And uh, and thankfully, I've been an expert at at, uh, at at this point through experience of getting through them. And and the way I would probably best describe it, um, you know, you start at the beginning of your journey. And if you decide what the end of your journey is, right? So in my case, I wanted to have a business that was going to be one of Ireland's largest companies. So I decided I'd set very clearly what the end looked like, what it, what, what, where we were, how many people we had, what our revenues were. And I made that a really, really clear uh, vision for me. And I got to the point where I go, okay, you know, I absolutely believe we can achieve it. And, and I use all sorts of different things, including meditation, to get my mind in a, in a good place. But one of the things that I do is I, I focus very much on my end goal. And I have a belief that we absolutely achieve it and we get there. So when I hit a roadblock on a Tuesday morning and you know we're one-tenth of the journey that I'm on and we get a major challenge, right? Whatever the challenge may be, I know I get around it because I know I achieve my end goal. So therefore, I'm able to hit the current issue with the understanding that I get around it. And I think what a lot of people do is they hit a, a roadblock in, in life or in business and they give up. And, and for me, the reason they give up is they're not clear on where they're going. And if they know they want to get to an end point and they know that they're going to get there, in my view, there is no roadblock that will hit anyone that they can't possibly get around. And, and again, believing in yourself, believing in what you're trying to achieve, but also getting your team and other people around you to believe. And then when you share that roadblock with people, quite often they disintegrate. And if I look back at the biggest challenges that we've had in the last 10 years, what I can say is 100% of them we've got over because we're still here. And now when we hit a, hit a challenge, no matter what the challenge is, we sit down and we go, well, we know we get past it. We've got through 100% of these in the past and we're going to break through. The EY Entrepreneur of the Year program is something that I always admired. I remember, you know, probably at 17, 18 years of age, watching it on television and being a spectacle. My dad would have been interested in it. And watching the people getting up, collecting their awards and listening to their businesses and how they've done it. Um, and in 2017, uh, I uh, went for the, the award and got nominated and got uh, onto the uh, Entrepreneur of the Year program. It was about making my family proud and, and almost a, a, a recognition for all the sacrifices that they made for me. Um, you know, uh, some of my family members helped me financially through the, through the difficult days. Um, my wife, uh, you know, put up with an awful lot of challenges that uh, somebody with a normal job and an income coming in on a consistent basis wouldn't have been. But, you know, the people that back you make a huge difference. And the EY Entrepreneur of the Year program allowed me to, to kind of uh, give everyone recognition for what they did. And that was what I saw it as. What it's evolved into for me is so much more than that. What I never anticipated was the, uh, the scale and the... The, uh, the, I'd almost call it the love between the different on entrepreneurs that are there. Everyone is in the same boat. You know, no matter what story I tell, everyone uh, in the group will have a similar story. They all understand what it's like to run a business. They understand how lonely it is to, to be there and not being able to pay a bill. They understand what it's like when somebody's ringing you, uh, looking for you to do something, but you can't be in four places at once and they understand what it is to balance and try and balance family and work and social and kind of bring it all together. You can go and talk to somebody about, you know, the fact that you have 150,000 euro debt that needs to be paid by this time next week and you don't have the money. And most people don't understand the, the psychological challenge with that. Um, and if you speak to a lot of people, they'll say, right, you're not going to get out of this one and you're in real trouble. 
you speak to an entrepreneur and they're literally start firing out, well, I was in that position and I did this. Have you tried invoice discount? Have you tried this finance house? Have you tried that finance house? Have you rang them and asked them, can you do it over 12 months? You know, they, they're, they're throwing 50 ideas at you within 35 seconds over a pint. And all of a sudden you've, you see a new way and a whole new way of dealing with an issue. Um, the group itself, you know, over 500 strong members, I think it's heading towards 600 people at this point. And, uh, and the amount of regular contact that exists, the amount of openness there is for both celebrating success and celebrating failures and rowing in behind people when they're really in trouble. And I think that's one of the really lovely things about the network.